Hey YouTube, this is Guy. Today we are lucky to have on the review table a Seiko Turtle reference SRP773. This turtle's on loan from a viewer, and I won't name him directly uh, in case he wants to remain anonymous, but I do want to say thank you very much for loaning me this wristwatch. I appreciate it greatly, and uh, with the generosity of people uh, that have sent me things for review, uh, you know, it's, it's helped so much. So again, thank you very much. Speaking of loans, there's another watch that I have on loan, which we'll see in a future video, a Sumo as well. We're going to see a side-by-side by-side of the Turtle, the Sumo, and, yep, the SKX uh, in a future video. But first things first, we're going to review the Turtle. I'll do a standalone video of the Sumo, and then we'll have that side-by-side-by-side by side by side review video sometime thereafter. So keep an eye out for those in the coming uh, week or two. Uh, that said, today what we're looking at again is the Seiko Turtle SRP773. Now there's a number of turtles, uh, uh, what do you call it, the reference number designations, 773, I think there's 775, 777, and 779 just color variations on um, the bezel and dial there, um, effectively the same watches. I guess also the potential bracelet and or strap, some of them only come on a, a rubber dive strap, and some of them come on a metal bracelet like the one that you see in front of you here. Uh, but yeah, today we're looking at the 773, which is the blue dialed variation on the uh, Seiko stainless steel uh, bracelet. It's uh, probably, I would guess, one of the more popular variations. I think people really enjoy the blue bezel, blue dial. And uh, I don't know, I mean, Seiko's rubber straps aren't bad, but uh, I don't know. For me, anyway, I tend to go for the bracelets. So I think that the fellow that lent this to me probably made the right decision all around. I, I might consider going for the black one, which I think is the 777, black dial, black bezel, if I were going to spend my money on it, but then I'd have to buy a bracelet for it after the fact, because that one comes on um, the rubber strap, and I just don't see myself wearing it on a rubber strap. Uh, but anyway, what can we tell you about this watch? I mean... When I saw this watch in pictures, I was always afraid to dive into it, <laughs> no pun intended, being as how it's a dive watch, uh, because of the size. In pictures, it looks really big, and it's this case, right? The turtle, kind of puffy, pillowed, uh, I don't know, puffed out uh, style case. In pictures, it looked like it was going to be too big. Well, I can tell you in person, that's really not the case. It is a large watch, and I'll go over the specs here in a second, um, but just because it's quote-unquote a large diameter watch doesn't mean that it's too large. And if you're familiar with the SKX, which, uh, you know, I, again, I have on my wrist today, it's really not overwhelmingly larger than the SKX as far as wrist presence. I mean, the, the, the numbers on paper, the, the dimensions, yeah, it's a little bit bigger. But how does it wear? It wears very similar, in my opinion. Just just a little bit bigger. If you were very, very thin-wristed, perhaps you would shy away from this. But I think if you have no problems pulling off the SKX watch, you're probably not going to have any problems pulling off a Turtle. <laughs> now, the Turtle is, just like the SKX, a ISO certified dive watch. And specifications are as followed. The case dimensions, uh, the diameter, we're looking at 54 millimeters in diameter. Um, the overall thickness is not too bad at 13 millimeters. Uh, get a nice close-up here of the side of the case and the thickness. Uh, 13 millimeters thick, not overwhelmingly thick for a dive watch. The lugs are, of course, 22 millimeters where your bracelet attaches. And the lug to lugs from the top of the lug or the bottom of the lug to the bottom of the lug, or what I like to call the watch's wingspan, is uh, pretty short. On my calibers, it comes caliper, it comes in at 47 and a half millimeters. And that's sort of indicative of Seiko watches having a fairly short overall lug to lug or wingspan dimension. That's why you can get away with wearing a watch that might have a little bit bigger of a overall dimension uh, in diameter. Uh, than you might normally be used to is because this top to bottom lug to lug width is usually on Seiko watches a little bit short. So it wears 
a little bit smaller than the overall diameter might suggest. Uh, the rest of the specs on this guy, it is of course 200 meter water resist, you got a screw down crown, screw down case back as well, uh, which facilitates that 200 meter water resist, and again it's ISO certified, so very high quality dive watch in that regard. Uh, we do have a day and date complication at 3 o'clock position, we have a unidirectional elapsed time bezel, of course, it wears a Seiko Hard Lex proprietary crystal and features Seiko's Lumabrite, Lumabrite luminescence material on all of the markers and handsets for the outstanding glow-in-the-dark uh, luminescence that we come to expect from Seiko. Uh, as previously mentioned, this particular variation comes on the stainless steel bracelet. This bracelet features the double locking fold-over push-button deployant clasp and it does also have a dive extension, which uh, I'll illustrate that in a little bit. Last but not least in regards to the specifications on this watch, it features Seiko's 4R36 movement. Uh, a little bit about that movement, the 4R36 is a 24 joule automatic movement with manual winding and hacking. Basically, not a whole lot of difference between the 4R36 and the more inexpensive 7S series of movements in my research. Uh, they both have around a 40 hour power reserve. Uh, this one, I looked at the specifications online for the non-branded NH36 movement and uh, it specifies that this movement will have a 41 hour power reserve. Um, basically the same as the 7S series of movements. Uh, vibrations or beats per hour is 21,600 of course, and you're getting the same kind of accuracy specification as you would from the more inexpensive movement. That is a range of no more than 40 seconds fast to no more than 20 seconds slow per day. The way that this differs from the 7S series of movements is um, really, you know, two, two main features, hand winding and hacking. And of course, this movement has 24 joules as opposed to 21 for the 7S26, but I don't think that's particularly important either for the purposes of our everyday use. But what is important again is it is a hand winding and a hacking movement. Uh, of course, hand winding, uh, you know, you would unscrew the crown and there's a little bit of spring pressure once it's unscrewed it pops out and you can spin it clockwise to wind the movement and of course hacking is when you pull the crown out to the first position past the first position excuse me to the second position uh it stops the movement you can see the uh, second hand has stopped running and in this position we could of course set the time to whatever we'd like let's just pretend it's five till nine and push it back in of course, it does have a quick set date, uh, day and date uh, by pulling it out to the first position. Uh, we could spin it clockwise or counterclockwise to change the day or the date setting. I'm not going to mess with those, though. Uh, it's important to know that when you're setting the day or date that you should have the watch set. I like to just set my watch to 6 o'clock. You don't want it set at a in a time frame where the gears are going to start kicking in and flipping over the day and date. And I might have this set at 9 p.m. right now as opposed to 9 a.m. I'm not 100% sure if that were the case and then potentially I could start messing with the day and date. If the gears were starting to kick in to do the daily flip, you could add some wear and tear on those gears. That would be bad. So anyway, what I do is I like to just set the time to 6 o'clock a.m. p.m. It doesn't really matter and then set the day and date and then set the time. Now the crown is of course out, pushing the downward pressure ever so slightly and spinning the crown clockwise. Screws it back in, seats down, no problem. Uh, the threading on the crown, very nice. Uh, much, much nicer than the threading on my SKX out of the box. Now, I don't know because I didn't open this for the first, first time this is on loan. I presume that the owner has had it for quite a while, so I can't say with 100% certainty that the threading is actually better. Maybe it's just a little more broken in. But at the state that it is right now, the threading feels very smooth and uh, very good. Now, that's basically all there really is to say about the movement. It's a slight upgrade over the more inexpensive, more common S7S series Seiko movements. Um, it's got the features that we all want, the hand winding and the hacking. That's probably the most notable thing. Now, 
comes the part of my reviews that I like to call quality design, features, and functionality. It's basically where I just kind of drill in on the main features and functionalities of the watches that I'm reviewing and talk about them. We did kind of cover the crown a little bit. I will touch on that ever so slightly again. There is no Seiko logo or signature on it. Again, it does screw down very nicely. The uh, texturing on the crown is, is typical of a Seiko crown. Uh, very easy to unwind it, get a grip on it. It's large, so there's no problems there. Uh, talking about the case, you can see that there's really not any sort of exposed crown guards coming off of the case. Um, since the case is a little bit bigger, there is kind of like a notch that the crown sets into there, but you don't get typical crown guards like you would on, on most watches. Um, could you bang the crown and, 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 and hurt it somehow? I suppose, I guess it's possible, but it seems pretty unlikely. And these are pretty tough watches in my estimation and from what I understand. So I wouldn't be too worried about the fact that there's not protruding crown guards coming off of the case. Now talking about the case itself, yeah, again, it does look like a big case in pictures. I mean, I wouldn't say that it is a small case in person, but it doesn't come off as large in person as I was expecting in pictures. And I'll throw it on my wrist in a little bit uh, towards the end of this video to, get, to show you guys what I mean, but it wears not a whole lot larger than my Seiko SKX. As far as the quality of the case, it's pretty typical finishing. You know, you have your brushed surfaces on the top of the case. Uh, down onto the lugs here, like you would expect on most Seikos. And then the sides of the case have a not super high mirror polish, but they are Seiko polished, I guess is what I would call it. Uh, it's, it's a decent polish, but not super, super crazy high mirrored polish. Uh, but it looks good. It, it's what you would come to expect if you have experience with Seiko watches. If you don't, it's probably, again, what you would come to expect for a watch at this price point. Now, after we talk about the case, usually I talk about the case back. This case back is nicely engraved. Uh, it's a little flatter than the SKX, so it doesn't feel like it would stand off on your wrist quite as much. I mean, it's not perfectly flat, but the SKX case does bulge a bit. This case is, or a case back is, of course, a screw down case back, and it has the Seiko Tsunami logo. Uh, company branding and the prospects branding on the bottom there. Uh, moving along after the case, we could talk about the bezel. The bezel on this watch is pretty well done. Uh, the, the rotating action is very smooth. It is relatively tight. I don't know if you can notice there. There's really no wiggle. Once it's, once you set it into a position, it, it, it's, it's there, it stays put. The, again, it's, it's, it's snug, but not difficult to spin. I don't know if you happen to saw, see uh, my previous review on the Orient Ray 2. That bezel was extremely stiff and difficult to turn. Eh, difficult is an overstatement, but it was extremely stiff. In comparison, all of my Seiko bezels, and this one is no exception, very, very nice and smooth. Um, I, I like them quite a bit. Now, the bezel is, of course, unidirectional. If you don't know why that's unidirectional, why you can't spin it clockwise as opposed to counterclockwise, uh, it's a safety mechanism for scuba divers, basically, so that you don't accidentally bump the bezel, change the time, and send it in, a dire in the direction that would cause you to assume that you have more time underwater than you believe you do. At the triangle area, the 12 o'clock position, uh, we do have a little pip with Lumabrite, so it uh, the bezel has a, a glow-in-the-dark point for reference if you're in a low-light situation underwater. Uh, the crystal is, again, Seiko's Hardlex crystal. Not a whole lot to say there. You know, supposedly a step above uh, mineral crystal. They're, they're fine. My experience with Hardlex crystals has always been positive. I've never scratched one. Uh, I've never shattered one. I've never had a problem with one. They look clear. I'm trying to show you some glare off of my studio lights. The glare isn't awful, but, you know, there's a little bit. I don't know if there's anti-reflective coating on it or not, to be perfectly honest. I suspect not at this price point, probably. Uh, shouldn't expect to have AR coatings. But the glare is not a problem, and outside of, like, direct sunlight or, you know, bright studio lights like that, you can see it's quite legible. 
Beneath the crystal, of course, we have the main event, the dial, the handset. Uh, layout on this is reminiscent of most Seiko watch, dive watch layouts. I think that the markers are a little bit of an upgrade over your cheaper SKX markers. Uh, see if we can get a good angle on there and I'll wipe off the crystal. There's probably some fingerprints and dust. I can't really tell if they're just painted on or applied markers, to be honest with you. They look like they're applied markers, but they don't have any sort of metallic outline. Um, for example, if we look at this Sumo watch, uh, once we focus, you can see that the markers on this watch are quite clearly applied markers and they have a nice metal outline on them. Uh, the circles, all, all of the markers do. The markers here on this turtle watch, they do again look like they're applied markers, but I just don't see any sort of shiny stainless steel or metallic outline on them. But uh, they do feature, of course, Seiko's Luma Bright Luminescence paint, and I'll bring in a example of the loom on this watch. I'll shoot a minute or so of video of this watch and no light with a very strong charge. The loom on it is just like every other Seiko watch. It's quite good. So, I mean, you know, there's not much to say. Unless you're completely unfamiliar with the fact that Seiko has some of the best loom in the industry, uh, you know, I don't really have to say much. You know, Seiko's loom is very good. It glows in the dark very brightly. It lasts a long time. Uh, as far as the dial layout, the 12 o'clock position has sort of a unique looking marker. I mean, I don't even know, is that marker, it kind of kind of looks like it should be something. It's kind of like got this sword with these little, uh, I don't know, trapezoids or something off either side. But then if I look at it in another angle, it's like, it kind of looks like a swim fin almost. It's, it's interesting. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be representative of a real th thing or if it's just shapes. Uh, regardless, the markers at the six and nine are... Uh, kind of, again, uh, square-ish, trapezoid-ish. Uh, and then you have your circles at all the other positions, with the exception of 3 o'clock, where you have uh, the day and date, of course. The day and date window is not outlined or framed with any metal or any sort of accent paint or material at all. It's just set in and slightly beveled. I think if we get really close in there, you can see there's just an ever ever so slight bevel there. Uh, it, it's fine. The day and date wheels are white with black text, perfectly legible. No complaints there. The branding on the dial, I don't know, some people don't like the Prospects branding. The I mean, We have Seiko up at the 12 o'clock position. Below the handset you can see there's that Prospects logo, automatic diver 200 meter. I don't know why people dislike some people, not all people, but some people dislike the Prospects branding and logo. I have no problem with it. I, I, I don't know. I just don't care one way or the other, to be completely honest. I don't think it adds or detracts from the layout of the dial. Uh, that said, you know, that that's basically your branding. Then at the very bottom, you have Made in Japan. And some very, very tiny text that I can't even make out. I'm pretty sure it's 4 r 36 dash something something. Uh, 4R36 of course being the movement in the watch. Uh, the chapter ring on this is a very typical dive watch, in particular Seiko dive watch chapter ring. It is um, kind of like a angled chapter, chapter ring which sets the face of the dial down a little bit into the case of the watch. Um, it's, it's fine, you know, it, it's come to be the style chapter ring that I expect. The hash marks at the main minute markers are uh, a little bit thicker, a little embellished to make it easier to see. Um, it's good. There's no no problems there. T uh, very, very common to have alignment issues with your chapter rings. This particular example has no alignment issues at all. You can get alignment issues with your bezel, get alignment issues with that chapter ring, alignment issues with your hands, with your day and date. This particular watch is all squared away. My uh, viewer that loaned it to me got lucky in, in that regard. Although maybe this is a little bit more of an uh, expensive Prospects line watch. Maybe they take better care of the quality control in those watches. I can't say for certain. I sort of doubt it, but um, I'm not 
100% positive. As far as the handsets go, uh, I believe it's an identical handset to what we find on the Seiko SKX. As a matter of fact, I can bring that SKX into frame here. Uh, it looks like, yeah, they're virtually identical, if not identical, handsets. You have the arrow on the minute hand, the hour hand is just, uh, you know, the typical Seiko pointer. And then the second hand has the pip of circle, circular pip of loom at the counterbalance side with the white painted point on the uh, pointer side. It's fine, I actually like this handset very much, and I have no complaints there. Seiko does have some handsets, like in particular, I'm very interested in their um, Shogun, the, yeah, all titanium Shogun. Uh, it is about a thousand dollar watch. The problem is I really don't care for the hour hand in particular. The hour hand is a very, very big arrow pointer. Whereas the arrow pointer on this minute hand is kind of uh, understated, I guess. Uh, on that Shogun, well, on that, sh yeah, the Shogun. On that Shogun watch, I think that it's overdone. I think it's too much. So I really do like the handset on, on this watch. And, and again, it's the same handset that we find on the Seiko SKX. Now, really not much else to talk about other than, I guess, the Bracelet, I haven't really touched on the bracelet. Bracelet is a stainless steel bracelet, um, kind of an oyster style bracelet. However, you have these little, um, it's not on the center links, it's on the end links. These little lines that are polished, but the rest of the bracelet is brushed. It's a nice looking bracelet. Uh, not a lot of flex, it's fairly rigid. The only thing that I don't really like about these style links, they're not, the center links I like, the center links to be like independent of the the end the side ends portions. Let me show you an example of what I mean. So here's my Hamilton watch. You can see that the center portion of the links are completely independent of the edge edge links, right? This watch, it's all just one piece. Every link is one solid piece. Now, the reason why that kind of matters, I guess, is if we set the watch down, it doesn't really want to sit very flat and kind of kind of teeter-totters. Uh, it's very, very minor. I mean, I'm splitting hairs here, nitpicking, if you will. I just don't prefer that style link if I had my way. Now, what that does do is it makes the bracelet a little bit more rigid. Uh, which may or may not be a good thing for you. I don't know if you like a bracelet that has a little more play, like the Jubilee bracelet that we find on the SKX. Very, very kind of, I don't know, floppy bracelet. All, all, all sorts of play there, but it's comfortable. This bracelet, while I have worn this watch a little bit just around the house to get a feel for it, this bracelet is rigid, which basically kind of means that it stays real put on your wrist and uh, getting it to kind of move around if you're getting a little warm or whatever. A little bit more challenging because of that but it's not an issue it's and it is a nice looking bracelet now the bracelet does again have the fold over safety portion of the clasp with dual push button deployant which is nice the swing arm is of course your inexpensive cheap stamped metal the clasp itself also just a very thin cheap metal stamped out buckle or clasp we do have four micro adjustment holes, and if you know anything about me, you know that I love micro adjustment holes. I could see it having five and being a little happier, but at least it has four. I hate when your clasps only have two. That's the worst. It's very difficult to find a nice, a nice size. It's unless you have the option of getting half links for your bracelet. Sizing up a bracelet that only has two micro adjustment holes on the clasp is sort of a pain. Uh, but yeah, otherwise it's pretty typical. Seiko clasp on the bracelet, and while the bracelet is fairly nice, Seiko clasps are eh, not great, to be completely honest. I'm not gonna, not gonna lie to you. Uh, they're unimpressive, but they work. I've never had one break or fall off on me, so I guess I shouldn't really complain about them. They're just not very special. You have the Seiko branding there on the fold over safety portion. I did mention that it has a diver's extension on this area of the clasp. There's this little piece on the underside. What you do is probably going to be difficult because I literally just cut my fingernails, but you get under there, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to do it without hurting myself because I just trimmed all my fingernails off. So I'm not going to bother. But you fold that open and then this piece un unhinges and you can extend the bracelet about, I don't know, a quarter of an inch, maybe a half of an inch. A useful if you're scuba diving and you need to slide the bracelet over a wetsuit. Um, but a little bit difficult to unhinge, especially if you literally just trimmed your fingernails. <laughs> uh, so don't hurt yourself like I almost did. Um, not much else to say about it. I am going to go ahead and throw it on my wrist. I said I'd give you guys a wrist shot of it. Uh, we'll do a quick side-by-side -side since I'm taking my SKX off. You know, next to, next to it, it does look quite a bit bigger, but I'm, I'm going to tell you in person, it's really not very significant in the size difference. So throw it on the wrist real quick, just so happens that the viewer that loaned me this watch has relatively the same size wrist that I do, so I didn't have to add or remove any links. Um, but there it is, on my roughly seven inch wrist. Uh, it's just a hair snug, I suppose, but it's not bad. I think that, well, yes, it is bigger than the SKX, it is not, a detriment. Uh, it's not something that I would shy away from wearing because of the size. And again, it's this this dimension here, from the top of the lugs to the bottom of the lugs. It's not it's not very big. It doesn't it doesn't want to hug over my wrist. It w it's it's not very thick, as you can see. It doesn't stand off the wrist really far. Overall, it's you know. It's, the proportions are quite good, if I'm being honest. I was surprised when I saw it for the first time out of the box at uh, in just how well the proportions actually worked. Because again, looking at the pictures of it online, I was always shying away from it because of this puffy case. And really what it is, if, if, if you think about it, it's that the, I don't know, lugs, I guess, like they don't, it's this, there's all this extra material here in this area, down here. That's what really makes it look big. It, it's just got extra material around this outer perimeter, I think. So, you know, the lugs aren't shaved in. Um, that's, that's really kind of, I don't know, the optical illusion, I guess. But, again, for me, I could wear it all day. I don't think that I would shy away from it because of the size. I think that it's actually sized fairly well. Albeit on the larger size, I wouldn't want to go a whole heck of a lot bigger in any watch. But it certainly was not what I was expecting. I was expecting it to be a little bit overwhelming in size, and it's, it's, it's really not overwhelming. Well guys, that's basically everything that I'm gonna have for you today on the Seiko Turtle SRP773. I, again, really appreciate the viewer that loaned this to me. I can't thank him enough for that. And, uh, again, don't forget, in the near future, I am going to have a review of this Seiko Sumo, the reference number on that. Uh, I forget off the top of my head. But stay tuned. We're going to have a review of this Sumo, and then I'm going to do the side-by-side-by-side -side -side comparison of all three of these wristwatches. So thanks again. Down in the notes section below this video, if you're interested in buying a turtle, I'll have links to my Amazon affiliate account where you can find this one and the other color variations. Of course, I get a small commission if you guys click those links and purchase the watches through Amazon, uh, which helps me out continue to purchase new products to review for the channel. Uh, there's also going to be links down there to my social medias and a couple of other suggestions on how you can help the channel out if you're interested. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. I appreciate it. And I will have the Seiko Sumo review in the very near future. I'm going to guess before the end of this week. I want to get all of these knocked out pretty quick. So stay tuned for that. And then again, the three-way comparison video. Take care. Have a good one. Bye.